Okay, good evening, everybody. We're going to attempt this evening something that we have not attempted before, and that is to go through three chapters in one night. Uh, but it's not going to be as hard as it sounds, because as we have reached now, up, we're up to chapter 15, with the first 14 chapters behind us, so there is a lot of concepts, a lot of principles and themes that we're much more familiar with now. And so while the earlier chapters of Tanya, you need to really go through much slower than we have done anyway in, over the last few weeks. But as you get through it, the concepts become much more familiar. You sort of know the language now. And so we can, we can get through a little bit faster. Uh, but also these last three chapters that we're going to do this evening, 15, 16, and 17, do go together as they are the end of the second section of Tanya that is going through, particularly getting to the real crux of what Tanya is about, and that is the mission of the Benini, the intermediate. And so as we're going to see, chapters 15, 16, and 17 are giving us an insight into the day in the life of a Benini, some tools for the struggle that the Benini is up for. What we're going to see, particularly in chapter 15 now, is an answer to a question that may have come up in some of your minds. Recall that we mentioned, and Tanya quotes this at the very beginning, that before our soul comes into the world, we are made to make an oath, be a tzaddik, do not be a rasha. We saw already in chapter 14 what the duality that, or the, the double nature of that oath is, be a tzaddik and, and do not be a rasha, because we said, well, if you're, not, if you're a tzaddik, you're not a rasha, so why does it have to say both? We explained that really it's saying try to be a benini, don't be a rasha, don't allow yourself to slip to being a rasha, and do everything you can to attempt to, at least in some areas of your life, be a tzaddik. And so, be a tzaddik, do not be a rasha. But why is there no oath to be a benini? If indeed, for most of us, our mission is not to be a tzaddik, that's not what we're going to be. But we do, definitely cannot let ourselves be a rasha. So why does the oath not say, be a benini? We never make an oath that I shall be a benini. We make an oath to be a tzaddik as best we can to not be a Russia, but we never actually make an oath be a Benini. So why does the Benini have to be implied in the, between the lines of the Tzaddik and the Russia without actually being, being emphatically, openly, and clearly stated that we'd never make the promise, our soul did nev never made an oath that we will be a Benini. So this question will be dealt with in chapter 15, because in chapter 15, the Alter Rebbe explains how being a true Benini means always being in the struggle. While Tzaddik and Russia are somewhat stagnant categories, Benini is a work in progress. It's different to a Tzaddik and a Russia. A Tzaddik is a Tzaddik. That's what you are. A Russia is a Russia. That's where they are. They're stuck in that. Whereas a Benini is not so much a level as a journey. The Benini is not so much a description of who you are, as a description of the journey you are on. A tzaddik has got there. They're not on the journey. They've, they've, they're, they're it. A rasha is sadly stuck, not on the journey, not going anywhere. A benini is not so much a level, a, a category, in the same way as a tzaddik and a rasha are. A benini is the description of somebody who is on a mission, who's on a journey, who is a work in progress. And, and this is what... Tanya is trying to encourage us to be. This, I think, is, is a very important concept to, to digest because as we've been going through it, we've felt sometimes a little bit helpless in even trying to be a Benini. It's so far from our current reality. After all, the Benini never sins, never does anything practically wrong, even though they have the urge to do it. But to be on that level seems to be beyond us. But from here we see that the Benini is not so much a level that you've got there, it's the struggle that you're in. It's being on that path of a Benini. And so therefore, perhaps we who have not really yet totally left the category of Russia, we still can identify wrongdoings that we have done that we haven't fixed up and we may do again. But we can still perhaps call ourselves in the category, in a general sense of a Benini, we're on the path, we're on the journey. That's what we're struggling, we're striving towards. And this is something that chapter 15 brings out in a fascinating way. In chapter 15, it starts by saying that in the category of Benini, there are also to be found two levels. Just like we saw, there's two types of Russia. 
There's the, the wicked person who has no regrets. Then there's the b- wicked person who's still wicked but has constant regrets. Just like we saw with the tzaddik, there's two levels. The tzaddik who is complete, totally disgusted by evil. And the incomplete tzaddik who is not disgusted by evil even though they're not tempted by it. So there's two types of rasha, two types of tzaddik in general. In Benini also, you could, there are two types. And they're called one who serves God and one who serves him not. So here you've already reached a level of Benini. And now we're going to tell you, okay, but which type of Benini are you? Are you the Benini that serves God or the Benini that serves him not? What are these two levels? Yet the latter is not wicked. But even the one that serves him not is not wicked. He's not a Russia. The reason he is referred to as one who serves him not is that he does not wage any battle against his evil disposition in order to vanquish it by means of the divine light that irradiates the divine soul. For his disposition does not confront him at all in an attempt to distract him from study and prayer. And he is consequently never obliged to wage war against it. Who are we talking about? Somebody who is a Benini, as far as practically speaking, they do no wrong. But they're not serving God because they don't have to put any effort in being a Benini. They're not waging any war because their disposition, their character, their, their personality is such that it doesn't confront the divine soul, doesn't cause an inner battle. They're not distracted, distressed, distracted from their studying, from their prayer, from, from doing good, and therefore they're not waging a war. Sound familiar? Someone who's not waging a war, not confronted by the inner battles. Let, let's see how Tani explains, describes this person. For example, one who is by nature a diligent student because he's organically so disposed and is likewise free from conflict with regard to sexual desire by reason of his frigid nature. And similarly with the other mundane pleasures wherein he naturally lacks any feeling of enjoyment. Hence, he does not need to concentrate so much on the greatness of God in order to guard himself against violation of the prohibitive commandments. We're talking about somebody who is able to sit and study and concentrate and contemplate and focus, and they don't get disturbed. They do it easily and naturally. Their mind doesn't wander, doesn't run away and race into other things. They're able to just meditate, pray, study, and stick with it. It comes naturally to them. They have what in Yiddish is called zitzflesh. Zitzflesh means, literally means the meat that, that, that allows you to sit. That, that, that they can sit and they, and they sit there. They're, they're not, they don't have got, haven't got ants in their pants. They're not, they're not running around. They're not all over the place. They're able to just sit and focus and they can therefore pray peacefully, tranquilly, with total serenity. They can study Torah for hours on end without being bothered and distracted and having to struggle to get back to it. They, they're, a, a, they're naturally predisposed to sitting, studying, meditating, being in that state. So too in sexual desire, they don't have any yetzahara, any evil inclination, any temptation towards immorality in the sexual area because they're cold in their nature. They're just not interested. They're, they're just not alive in that area. And so therefore, it's not tempting for them. It doesn't interest them. They're, they're just out of that battle completely. And so too with other physical pleasures. There are people who just don't have a real kick out of physical pleasures. They just don't get excited. Uh, whatever food you give them, yeah, this, that, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. They're just not excited by it. You, you, you take them to a beautiful scenery and they're just, they're just not interested. They're just, just not into it. So they're not tempted by anything physical and therefore they're not tempted to do anything wrong because the pleasures don't hold any, 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 anything in their soul. They don't, they, they doesn't drag them to anything. If you're not into pleasures, you're not into self-indulgence, so what can you do wrong already? <laughs> he, he, they just sit there and, and they say their prayers, do, do, they do their learning and their study, and they'll do whatever good they're supposed to do, but they're, but they're just not pleasure seekers, such a person. And so therefore, they don't have to constantly try and remind themselves of the greatness of God, of the importance of being a moral person, of the higher purpose in life, of the, the divine soul's yearnings. They don't really have to get into that because there's no opposition to it in the first place. 
there's nothing holding them back from doing what the divine soul desires. This world just simply does not hold any attraction for this person. Does that sound familiar at all? Not really? Can't think of, of anyone that you know that's like that? Don't mention names, but if you... Know, if, if you um, it, it is, it's hard to really imagine such a person to that extreme, but I guess to some ex extent, you kind of, there, are, there are some people who just... It sounds like someone that's depressed. <laughs> well... No, it sounds like someone that's a dick. Well, I'm a depressed person because a depressed person can focus and learn and study. Correct. Correct. If, oh, if, yeah. if they're depressed, they, then, then even the spiritual side of things would also be distracted. Yeah, yeah, right. So, that, so the fact that this person is able to study and pray, and they, they do have a spiritual life. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just don't have the color, the, the excitement, the, the passion of this world. just doesn't interest them at all. Is their spirituality passionate? To an extent it would be. But... Because there's no friction, there's no, there's no struggle there, so it's a somewhat bland life that they're living. It's pretty straightforward. They're good. We can't fault this person. They're good. They do good. They, they, they're spiritually connected. They're, they're doing everything right. You can't find anything wrong in them. But they're not struggling. They're not battling. Dreamers? What do you mean? I mean, are they this person that you're describing? Mm -hmm. Are they? Is it a person who would be thinking of ideas, or they just learning? They taking in, or they thinking of um, ways to create? Well, that's an interesting question. They they're certainly taking in their study, their learning. They're certainly taking it in, but whether they they're looking for ways to create to expand whether they're ambitious or their vision not necessarily because why should they they've, everything they've got is fine so why should they even bother moving forward from where they are their, their current circumstance is so balanced they're happy with their lives. yeah they'd be quite happy with where they are Such yeah yeah, the, when there's a struggle, when there's another side trying to attack, so then you have to counterattack. When the animal soul is raging with desires and distractions, so then you have to battle back, you have to fight back. But he, this person doesn't have to. They just, they, it's, it's quite one-sided, their, their battle. It's, so if it's a problem or an issue or whatever, a challenge, it's just easily, they, they, they can resolve it easily. Well, nothing's a challenge. Well, they probably, they probably would be able to resolve things quite easily because they don't have the duality the rest of us have of seeing two sides of it. Our animal soul sees the situation this way, our divine soul in a different way, and we're struggling to recognize which voice is which and which is true and which, which is false. This person doesn't seem to have that type of battle, not because they've conquered their animal soul. Remember, that's a tzaddik. A tzaddik is somebody who has transformed their animal soul, and so they serve God with a passion. The animalistic passion has become holy. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about somebody who's not all that passionate in the first place, who, who is just a, quite a, a lukewarm personality. And so there's no passion necessarily, and therefore there's no drive uh, to create or to, to expand or to go further because what for? Everything's fine as it is. It's almost like this person is a Bainani by default. By accident, they're a Bainani. They're not a Bainani through struggling and getting there. They're a Bainani because the, the, the enemy didn't show up. <laughs> the, 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 the other team just, just, just didn't come to the, to the contest. And so they're, they're born with this lukewarm character so there's not much of a battle here. But are we on this journey to become like that? So is this, is, this a good, is this a good way to be? Is this our ideal? Is it, is this, is it, is, do we wish we could have this level? No. It doesn't sound all that good, does it? However, that kind of temperament is sometimes, like I look at my day, 
today. I wish I actually had a little bit of that temperament because I would probably resolve things without the passion and just be more focused and get on with it. Absolutely, there is there is a plus to, to being being dispassionate in some of our decisions, but here we're talking about to, to quite an extreme, where because then they're, they're not tempted by this world at all, so then they're never passionate. To be able to go to a dispassionate place and to to look rationally at a situation is a very important skill, and that we've been seeing is the the real crux of being a benini, is that the mind has to control the heart. The mind has to determine where to go. But controlling the heart doesn't mean negating the heart. It means directing the heart. But the heart then has to be passionate. Whereas this person, their mind controls the heart, but the heart is not all that wild in the first place. It's not all that energetic in the first place, at least on the animalistic side. And so, and so this person, Practically speaking, again, look, it's a very high level. This person is a Benini. They, they do it all right. They, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't transgress any of the commandments. They do everything good. But it's without a struggle. For him, for this person, continues the Alter Rebbe, for him suffices the hidden love that is in the heart of all Jews who are called the lovers of his name. Therefore, he is not at all called one who serves inasmuch as this latent love is not of his making or accomplishment, by any means, but it is our inheritance that has become, come down from the patriarchs to the whole community of Israel, as will be discussed further. We're going to see in later chapters of Tanya, this idea of a hidden love that we've inherited from our forefathers and foremothers, from, from, the, from the Jewish patriarchs and matriarchs. That we're going to see later on, but here, this Benini has a love for God, but a love for God that he was born with, that is innate, that he didn't develop on his own, that, that is an, his natural predisposition. And that love is enough for him to maintain his level of bainani, to serve God on this level. But you can't call him someone who serves. You actually can't call him someone who serves God. Because he didn't achieve this. He didn't earn this. He was born that way. This is, this is a nature that somebody is born with and they cannot take any credit for that whatsoever. They didn't earn any of it. It's not serving God in, in, in a way that you have initiated, you've developed, you've grown. It's, he was born with this placid nature and he's kept it. And that's it. And so if somebody is falling back on their nature to serve God and they were lucky enough to have a nature that doesn't challenge serving God, that's not called serving God. That's called following your instincts. And even though on a practical level, we're not saying this guy's bad or evil, this person is doing a lot of good, a lot of good. But the good that the person is doing is not of their own making. It's not working. It's not, it's not struggle. And so therefore, this is not our ideal. This is not where we really want to go. Like you have some people whose minds are all over the place, who, who don't think clearly, who when they're trying to f focus on one thing, a thousand other things pop into their head. Some of us can really relate to that picture on the left there, that, that this is how our mind feels, that you're trying to st study a book in depth and distractions. Suddenly you think about everything you need to do and everything you need, you, you need to go and er everything that's happening around you. You, you, you can't focus. You try to pray and, and the mind flies all over the place. That, that is a certain nature that, that most of us have. There are many other people who have the ability to concentrate to sit on one task, stick with it, and maintain focus on it for hours and hours and hours. That is their nature, that's their, their, their strength, that's something that they were born with. So these two people, one of them, for, that, for one of them to, to study uh, in a, for a, a sustained time period is extremely difficult. Because one idea will come into the head and then like, It'll lead to another thought and another distracting thing and then a beep in their pocket and then they're all over the place. They, they, they can't focus in one, on one thing. Whereas another person, just by nature, they can do it. They can just sit and sit and sit and focus on one thing. So if your nature is to be able to do that, when you do that, it's not a big deal. You may be taking in a lot of holy information. You're doing a lot of good by studying Torah for, for five hours straight. That's a very holy thing. You can't take it away. But... It's not serving God. It's not breaking yourself. 
Whereas another person whose mind is like this one with streamers coming out, that, that your mind's all over the place, for that person to break themselves and to sit and say, I am going to focus, I'm going to read for the next hour, I'm going to read this book of Tanya or whatever book I'm reading, and I'm not going to budge from it. And every time a, a distracting thought comes, you push it away and come back to the topic and back to it. And you spend a whole hour doing that. Somebody who really does that is serving God because they're breaking their nature. They're going above their, their natural ability. And so that's a completely different way of being. That some people are gifted with a, an uncomplicated soul. Not many people, but there are some people like that. They're able to, to, to focus and there's no distraction. They're able to, to be in one task the whole time. Then that's not their challenge. They may have other challenges, but this is not their challenge. And so therefore, that's no big deal. So too, with, with the example of the person who is cold in their nature, so therefore they're, they're not, they don't have sexual attractions. So that is not a great way to be necessarily either. But that will mean that they're not tempted. That that's not their temptation. They don't have these temptations. But that's their nature. That's not serving God. That's, 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 uh, that's something that they're born with. So, so that is called a benini who is not serving God. Because they're remaining where they are. How do you compare it to a Nazarite who's, who refrains from drinking wine? So he's working on, on his, not to drink the wine, but he's serving Hashem. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's the question? The question is, uh, he's depriving himself. Yeah. So he's a. He's, so would you call him a benoni? Not, not enough as a benoni. That, that depends on everything else in his life. He's trying. But that's serving Hashem. That's yeah, yeah. But Hashem doesn't want him to do that. That's why he had to bring a korban chatas after thirty days. <laughs> yeah, but it's still a mitzvah. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. Still. But you cannot call him a benoni. Yeah. yeah. No, no. <laughs> so. That's, this is one type of Baini who's not serving God, who's called not serving God because they're just following their nature. Another example would be, so too, one who, although by nature not an assiduous student, has accustomed himself to study with great diligence, so that the habit has become second nature. For him too, suffices the innate love unless he wishes to study more than his habit. Not only is somebody who's serving God with their nature not serving God, because that's just your nature, even somebody who that was not your nature, but you've developed a second nature through habit. If you continue to serve God through habit, it's no longer serving God. Only doing more than your habit is serving God. So I remember when I was studying in, in yeshiva in Israel, so a practice that I heard from one of my teachers was to try and, when studying, look inside the book that you're studying and not look up. Not look out of the book. Even if you want to think, just keep your eyes on the page and see how long you could do it. And, and I tried it, like I could do it for an hour, I, I, after a while, I could do it for an hour. And it's excruciating. It, it is excruciating to do it, but it's very, it's very rewarding. It's quite a meditative thing. You're just focused on, on a page for a full hour. And so you're reading and studying and you're not, that, that helps the thoughts not be distracted because you're not looking around. It, it's very easy to look around and notice things around you, people around you, and then you're all over. By keeping your eyes on the page, you train yourself and your focus becomes better. And by exercising this, you can actually, even a person who has the streamers flying out of their brain usually, can start to focus and be a more intense thinker, a more focused, concentrating, think, concentrated thinker. But once that becomes natural, once that becomes easy, so then that's not serving God either anymore. If you can do that for an hour, but that's natural to you now, you weren't that way before, but now you are. That's also not serving God, unless you want to do more. So, what this, what Rabbi, Rabbi Shnei Zalman here, the Alter Rebbe in this chapter 15 is trying to bring us, is the idea, serving God is not so much about how much you're doing, but it's how far you've gone. How much you're stretching yourself. How much there's a battle. If you're born with a, with a placid nature, so then that's great, and you're a nice person. But... To serve God means to become a nicer person than you were born, to expand yourself, to stretch yourself further, to do what's a bit hard for you, not your easy, not your nature. So too, if you were born not such a nice person, but you've become a nice person, but if that's through habit, once you've become comfortable in that level of niceness, it's no longer serving God, you have to stretch yourself further. 
If you're able to focus easily and study, and study for 10 hours a day, that's nice, but you're born that way. If you weren't born that way, but you train yourself to do that, then you've also just become a habitual being that's not serving God. It's the stretch of yourself. It's the, it's the, it's the pushing yourself further than your boundary. That's where you're actually serving God. When you're doing a little bit more than is comfortable, that's when you're doing it for Him. You're not just being yourself anymore. And so, whether it's by nature or, or, or by nurture that you've developed a particular spiritual ability, once that's become normal for you, it's not serving God. You have to stretch yourself a little bit further. This will explain an interesting statement in the Talmud. The Talmud says about this one who serves God and one who does, does not serve God. The Talmud says this refers to somebody who reviews his learning 101 times, while one who serves him not refers to someone who repeats his learning no more than 100 times. Okay, so somebody who serves God means somebody who goes over something they studied 101 times. Who's somebody who is not serving God? Somebody who reviews what they learned 100 times. Says the Alter Rebbe, this is what, what, what's the Talmud saying here? What's the difference between studying something 100 times, 101 times? If you have, have studied 100, 100 times, is, is that no good? This is because in those days it was customary to review each lesson 100 times. In the times of the Talmud, the rabbi would give a lesson and then the students would go off and review it 100 times. That, to be considered a student, you had to do that. If you didn't review your lesson 100 times, then don't come to the next class because you're, you're, you're not ready for the next one yet. You've got, you've got to go, go over it 100 times. That was the normal thing to do. So, says the Talmud, so if you review it 100 times, you're not serving God. You're, you're just doing what's normal. It's, if you do it the 101st time, that's when you're serving God because that's not the norm. That, that's not expected. That's not the habit. Doing it that extra one time is taking you out of the category of not serving God into, yes, now you're serving God. Now you're stretching yourself. Of course, that's until you get used to the 101 time thing. And then you have to do it, do it more. So, this is, this, the Talmud here is, is illustrating it in such an extreme way to show that the one time is only 1% of the 100 times that you did it. But because the 100 times is expected... It's not yet serving God. You haven't stretched yourself. It's the one time you do extra that is actually serving God. The Talmud illustrates this by an example taken from the marketplace where donkey drivers used to hire themselves out at a rate of 10 parasangs for a zuz, but for 11 parasangs charged two zuzim. A parasang is a Persian mile. It's a, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a couple of kilometers. And, so, and a zuz is it was a, a, yeah, a gold coin. So the price to travel 10 parasangs was one zuz. But if you want to go 11 parasangs, that's two zuzim. Double the price for one extra parasang. Why? Because that was more than what they usually did. 10 parasangs was the standard trip. Once you're going beyond that, it, it's more. You know, it's like they charge you sometimes, you know, the, the, the tradesmen come and they charge you, you know, for, for the first hour is this much, but the second hour is much more. Because if it's not done in an hour, so then that's already going beyond what we, what we usually do. And somehow they always do go a few minutes beyond the hour. So, so the, 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 donkey, the donkey drivers at the market would tell you, 10 parasangs, that's for one zuz. Do you want to go one more parasang? 11 parasangs? That's, that's double the price. Because it's beyond what is the norm. The Talmud uses this as an illustration to say that one extra is what takes more out of you. That's an effort. And that's serving God. The serving God is in that little area where you stretched yourself a little bit further. You did more than is your norm. And, and so it's not, therefore, to say whether somebody's serving God or not cannot be measured by just how much good they're doing. There may be one person who's doing a lot of good, who is, is very kind and generous, very spiritually attuned, and doing a lot of mitzvahs. But that is what they were born doing. That was what they always did. Whereas another person who it's new to them, they're challenging themselves, they're taking on more, that person is serving God, whereas the first one is not. You know, many people ask um, about uh, somebody who, let's say, who grew up religious. And they might, they might say, you know, I know somebody who grew up in a religious home, but they're not a nice person. And they don't do this and don't do that. And I don't, I don't understand. Well, it's very possible for somebody to grow up in a religious home 
And that is their culture. That is just the way they are. Like that's what they've always been used to. So they may do a lot of mitzvahs, they may do a lot of good, but they, they haven't challenged themselves to do more. And so that person is not serving God. They're, they're, they're following the ways of their parents. They're doing what they've always done, but they're not yet serving God. Until somebody who grew up in a religious home takes it on themselves and starts challenging themselves to grow further, to do more, to, to develop themselves internally, they're not yet serving God. And in fact, this is a greater challenge for somebody who did grow up in a religious home as opposed to somebody who didn't. If you didn't grow up in a religious home and you start doing a mitzvah or two, so then it's a big deal. It's a, gra- it's a great thing. It's amazing. Look how far you've gone. Whereas somebody who did grow up in it has to find a deeper way of st- stretching themselves because they've done that all, the, all their lives. So it's not such a big deal. Somebody, for example, who kept Shabbat their entire life, so they continue to keep Shabbat. I mean, what, el- what else would they do? That- that's just part of their culture, part of their, their routine. Whereas somebody who never did it and starts keeping it, it's a big jump, it's a big leap. It's, it's a very exciting spiritual journey that they're on. But the person who grew up with it also has to become one who serves God, meaning somebody who stretches themselves. They have to find a deeper level of keeping Shabbat. Maybe they keep it all correctly, but they have to do it on a deeper level. They have to internalize it more. They, they have to take it to, to, to a, a new level that they hadn't experienced before by studying the laws and by studying the deeper meaning of it. And so too with every mitzvah and every commandment, that you, it doesn't matter how many you're doing, it matters how far you're going, how, how much you're challenging yourself to go further. And that is, a, a, that, that is the benini that is serving God, that is on a mission, that is on a, on a, on a process, a work, a work in progress. So this 101st revision, the, the, the time they did it the 101st time, which is beyond the normal practice to which the student had been accustomed since childhood, is considered equivalent to all the previous 100 times put together, and even surpassing them in endurance and effort, hence entitling him to be called one who serves God. That that 101st time is worth all of the ones before, even more, because it's stretching yourself a bit more. It's going further than the norm. So for in order to, the reason why this is so valued is because in order to change his habitual nature, he must arouse the love of God by means of meditation in his mind on the greatness of God in order to gain mastery over the left part of the heart, which is full of blood of the animal soul originating in the clipper, whence comes his nature. Meaning, when you have studied a hundred times, you've done the hundred times revision, which is what you've always done since you were a little kid, and that's what everyone does, a hundred time revision. To do it one more time is so hard is so difficult. Why? Because that's where your animal soul stands up and says, what's wrong with you? You've done it a hundred times. You've done it just like everyone else has done it. You've done it like you always did it. Why do you need to go further? What, what are you missing? What, what's wrong with where you are now? Our animal soul stands up and is frightened, is threatened by the idea that we're going to stretch ourselves any further. That is where the animal soul fights. And so therefore, to get yourself to do that hundred and first time revision is the most excruciating thing. The hundred times was fine. Your animal soul is comfortable with that. That's, that's your nature. That's, that's your habit. But to do it one more time, that's where the animal soul is going to put up every defense possible to stop you doing it. And so in order to overcome that, the Benini had to arouse a real passion in their heart. They had to overcome the animal soul's resistance in order to do it again, to do it that, that extra time. And they had to, that means they had to dig deeper. And they had to develop a deeper commitment to God and, and to holiness. That I want to study an, an, uh, this, this extra time to really absorb the divine wisdom. I want to serve God. I want to stretch myself. And that desire to stretch yourself is only fulfilled by going deeper and revealing a deeper love, a, le- a deeper passion, a deeper energy that can overcome the animal soul in the left, in the left part of the heart that is full of blood, which is where the, the clipper is, is sourced. Because that is our nature. Our nature is in our animal soul. The divine soul has a, is not nature. It's a, it's a higher thing. The, the animal soul is our comfort zone. Going beyond it means arousing a deeper divine love. And this is, the Alter Rebbe, is the ultimate mission of a Benini. This is it. To be constantly growing a little bit further. To be taking little steps. Not studying 200 times but doing it 101 times. Not jumping too far in your spiritual growth, but taking a little step more than you've done until now. Pushing yourself a little bit further. 
This is the ultimate mission of the Bainini. This is what the Bainini is all about. Somebody who is challenging themselves to do a bit more, allowing themselves to be a little bit uncomfortable, the animal soul at least, to be a little bit uncomfortable in order to create more divine energy, more holiness in the world. This is what a Bainini is all about. Yeah. In the Torah, we say, Torah Sivalan Moshe, the Torah which Moses commanded us. In the word Siva, the three letters make up 201. Mm-hmm. Tzaddik is 90, Vav is 6, 96, yeah. and He is 5. So here we have a hint from the Torah, you should go 101, not 100. Correct, right. yeah, yeah, that's right. From the word Siva. Yeah, very good. Very good. Okay, so this is, the, this is the message of chapter 15, that you've got to take yourself further. You've got to, to serve God, you've got to be stretching yourself a step further. In chapter 16, the Alter Rebbe addresses another level in the Benini. That it seems that the Benini's life might be a little bit dry. Certainly the Benini that doesn't have struggles, that's a dry life. But even the Benini that does have struggles... If you're doing the right thing, even though you don't feel like it, even though you're not inspired to do it, how passionate can you be if your heart is not in it? If you're constantly overwhelming your heart, overcoming your heart, beating yourself, stretching yourself, so isn't there a time when that snaps? Doesn't eventually is there is there no if there's no heart in it, if you're if you're not feeling it, if you're always breaking yourself, so then isn't there a time when that catches up with you? and you just say, I've had enough of this, I'm exhausted. If you're always going that 101st stage, pushing yourself further, so then isn't that a time when that just gets too hard? For the tzaddik, the tzaddik is somebody who has beaten their animal soul, controlled it and turned it around, and so therefore their entire passion is for good. The benini, on the other hand, still their heart is not fully with the program. Their heart all does stray, and they have to constantly beat their desires, overcome their desires, overwhelm them. So isn't that going to become a negating of emotional self and a dry existence where you're not feeling it, you're not really with it? And if you're constantly doing that, aren't you going to snap eventually? Isn't it going to fall apart? How does a Benini keep up with this struggle if they're constantly negating their heart? So what we're going to see in chapter 16... The Alter Rebbe clarifies that the Baini indeed serves God with inner passion and heartfelt conviction, conviction, not merely practical commitment. They're not just committing themselves against their desires. The Baini is, has, a, has a very colorful emotional life and their commitment to doing good, to godliness, is with inner passion and, and with, a, with a lot of feeling. It may not be to the same level as a tzaddik. They haven't reached the level where their heart totally flows with their divine soul. They still have the animal soul as a resistance. However, that doesn't mean that there's no emotion going on in their spiritual work. They're very much having a a, a passionate and and heartfelt relationship with God. And in chapter 16, the Altarebbe offers a method to awaken a deeply emotional spirituality, even though you're not a tzaddik. You may be not on the level of a tzaddik where your heart is totally pure where you have no temptations, no desires that are evil and selfish. You're not on that level. But nevertheless, because the divine soul does have a base in the heart, the right side of the heart, there is a a divine emotions there. Even while the left side of the heart is still not totally purified, you can still have a passionate, deeply felt emotional bond with God and do good that is is, uh, emotionally backed up. Let's go into chapter 16. This then is the essential principle regarding the divine service for the Benini. The main thing is to govern and rule the animal nature that is in the left ventricle of the heart by means of meditation in the mind on the greatness of the blessed Ein Sof, the infinite one. And this understanding will arouse a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord in his mind and at the same time creating the love of God in his heart, in the right part, with a fervor and desire to cleave to him through the fulfillment of the precepts of the Torah and of the rabbis and through the study of the Torah, which is equivalent to them all. What these words mean is that what's the essential principle? What is the life of a Benini about? It is about governing, ruling over, controlling the animal desires, keeping them at bay. How do you do that? By utilizing the mind. 
The mind has to meditate, has to be clear on what's right and wrong. The mind has to saturate itself with, with divine wisdom, with a sense of holiness. Through studying a work like Tanya, filling our mind with clarity, spiritual clarity, and, and thinking into it deeply, when you think about the greatness of God, the gift that he's given us in, in being alive, and the mission that he's given us to do good in this world, when that it fills your mind, so the, the understanding will arouse in your mind a certain awe and a love of God in your heart, you will feel an emotion of love of God. When you really contemplate the greatness of God, the, the fact that God fills all existence, God is not just a player in the corner of the universe somewhere. God is the truth of everything. God is, is all, and all is God. When you contemplate on that idea that God is everything, God is in everything, God, God is the, the source and the truth and the existence of everything, there's nothing devoid of Him, nothing separate from Him. He is, he is the reality. This will arouse in you a love of Him. Because if you think about it, we have a love in our heart. Before we decide what, we've lo- what we love, the love is already there. Our, our heart has the capacity to love. The heart is just waiting to be told, what should I love? So before you're aware of anything, the heart has love in it, has the power of love. It's waiting to see, what should I love? Who tells the heart what to love? Your mind. What you see in your mind as being good, your heart loves. What you see in your mind as being no good, your heart avoids, doesn't want, hates. And so you in your mind have to clarify what is good and what is not. And your heart will follow that. So, and this is true of everything in our lives. Anything in our life that our heart desires is because our mind tells us, tells us that this is good. And even if we realize it's not good, we still think it is good, we convince ourselves it's good, and therefore we love it and we chase after it. Even if all the facts tell us otherwise, but we haven't really processed those facts. We're, we're still convinced that it's good somehow, somewhere. We only love that which we think is good. If we know something is bad, we don't love it. But the knowledge has to be clear. The, when the knowledge is clear, you, then, then the love follows. So if we meditated on the idea of God, that God is the source of all goodness, there is no blessing in the world that is not from God. There is nothing in the world that is not from God. All, all comes from Him. All of our, our life, our existence, everything is Him. If that would be real to us, our heart would automatically be filled with a love of God. Indeed, the left side of our heart is still our animalistic side that still has desires for things that are not good, the th- things, things that, that, are, that are selfish and immoral. But the right side of our heart will be filled with a love of only goodness, only what God wants. Because if the mind gets it clear, the heart follows. So the left side is at bay, is controlled, and the right side of the heart is filled with the love of God by contemplating this reality. And what that will result in is a desire to connect to God. The only thing that you'll want to do is connect to God and to do what He wants, the goodness that He wants from you. And that will be expressed through fulfilling the mitzvahs, fulfilling the precepts of the Torah. What mitzvah is there I can do? What can I do to connect to God? And so there's the spiritual acts that we do between us and God. And then there's the acts that we do between us and a fellow human being. Both of them are are, uh, of, of equal importance because this is the way we express the divine will. We want to do good in the world. We want to be kind. We want, we want to bring godliness into the world because what else should we do? What else should we chase after? That comes through a meditation. The more aware you are of God, the more you want to do what He wants, the more good you want to do in the world. And to do something selfish, immoral, hurtful, is, is just, why would you do that? Your, your, your heart still may desire that on the left side, your animal soul, but you've got such control over that because it's clear what you're supposed to be doing, that you're supposed to be doing the right thing. And so while you may be tempted to do something selfish and immoral, your mind is in control and says no to that side of the heart. And the other side, the good, holy, elevated side of the heart is full of passion for doing good. This is where the Bainani exists. This is the essential principle of the divine service of a Bainani. Now, he makes it sound like quite a simple process. That, that if, you, if you fill your mind with the concept of God, you'll only want good. And you'll only do good and you'll, you'll go on the right path. You want to do all the mitzvahs, you want to study Torah, you want to, you want to be, be good to the world. You're only going to want to do the right thing. But our experience 
is somewhat different from that. We all know that there are times when our mind may know the information, but it doesn't fully impact us to actually act on it. Sometimes the information, even we understand it in our mind, but it's, it's so distant from us, it's so abstract, that it's hard to see how that's going to impact us. Here you're talking about very lofty concepts, God filling all of existence, being, being the truth of everything. These are beautiful spiritual ideas. But sometimes we can find ourselves talking about spiritual ideas a lot, studying them a lot, getting into them a lot, but not necessarily does it fully impact our heart that we really get it, that we're really moved by it. That the idea is there, but it's not so clear in our mind that it should be such a reality. Let's look at an example of that in the, in, in the mundane world. Science uh, in studying the atom, the, the, studying the, the makeup of an atom, says the following thing, that a hydrogen atom is about 99.999999999996% empty space. Put in another way, if a hydrogen atom were the size of the Earth, the proton at its center would be about 200 meters across, and the rest of it, empty space. Meaning, our, our bodies, the world, everything around us is made up of atoms, of these tiny little particles. And science is, has, is now saying that these particles themselves are 99 etc. percent empty space. There is a, a proton at its, at its center, which is tiny, compared to the tininess of the atom. The rest of it is empty space. The, the metaphor given is that if, if an atom was the size of Earth, then the proton, which is taking up space in its center, is 200 meters wide. 200 meters compared to the, the rest of the Earth. Now, if you minimize that into tiny little atoms that make up the billions and billions of them make up our, our body and the world that we live in, so most of existence is empty space. This, this, is, uh, this is how science is, is, uh, is, is going. And this picture here is not to scale at all. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, 200 meters compared to the entire world, that little yellow spot there is not to scale to, the, to that, um, that uh, shape around it. So the empty space in the, in, the, in the atoms that make up our physical reality is the overwhelming majority of it, which means that, that we're really nothing. We're, our physical reality is really, really nothing. Lots and lots of nothing to the point where if you remove the empty space from atoms, the world's human population would fit into the volume of a sugar cube. Right? If you took all the human population of the, of the world and just took all the empty space away and just took what is taking up space and crammed it together, it would be the size of a sugar cube. So if you, if you just took away all the emptiness. And they say if you, if you took the, the entire population of all of history, it would fit into a, a baseball. That, that, that's how much space uh, it would take. Now, look, this is just a scientific idea. It's a, con it's a concept. And we can, we can talk about it and discuss it. I'm, I'm no scientist, but okay, I get, I get, I get the gist. I get, get what it's talking about. But do, like, do we really get that? Do we really understand what this means? Or is it a, it's a, it's a concept, it's a theory. It's, it's something that we, we can discuss and we can enjoy, we can be fascinated by. And, and there are people who spend their entire day on this very topic, studying into these things. But it's very much a, 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 a removed from our reality. It's talking about ourself, but it's very removed from our reality. It's not something that really hits us. And the truth is, much of our intellectual life is exactly the same as this that we talk about it, we discuss it, we know what we're talking about, but how real it is in our minds, not necessarily. Not necessarily has it become totally real. There are a lot of, there are a lot of ideas and concepts that we get it, but we don't get it fully. And yet, that doesn't necessarily stop us from moving on with life. 
we can study this, and we could actually study this for hours, and not really get what this Adam thing is, but get it enough to be able to continue and to study into it. And in fact, even the scientists who spend their lives studying the nature of the atom, do they actually really get what it is? Not necessarily. They, they know a lot about it. But how much do, do, do you actually get what we're talking about? What we're actually, have, 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 you, have we ever seen it? Can we describe it? Can we taste it? Not necessarily. But knowing enough about it, that's enough to continue the conversation, to, 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 move, to move on. We don't have to fully get things. And in fact, much of our day we spend doing things that are based on certain axioms and assumptions that we have, even though we don't fully understand and know why we're doing it. Much of what we do. Most of us don't really understand, for, exa for example, um, the way the economy functions. Like, we don't really get it. And, and when, 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 you know, when uh, the budget is announced, like, exactly what it means, we don't really get it. We just want to know what's the bottom line, you know, what, what does it mean for us? Like, so we, we're getting more money or less money? We have to pay more or, or pay less? Like, that, that's, that's what it, it means in the, in the end. The exact technicalities of it, we're not all that sure. But that doesn't stop us from talking about it. Or, you know, political issues that are happening in the world, conflicts that are happening. We don't exactly know all the sides and who they are and what they're... For, but we know enough to be able to form an opinion and to decide what we think is good and what we, we think is not good. Many things that we talk about in our, in our life, there's a certain level of understanding we have, and that's enough for us to function. And we don't need to necessarily go further than that. We don't have the capacity to fully experience every single idea or concept or thing that we hear about, but it's enough to just to move on, to, to live life with that information affecting us, even if it's not totally internalized. This is how a Bainini functions, which is different to the way a tzaddik functions. A tzaddik is a person who really gets God, who really is in communion with God, in connection with God. The divine concepts are so real for a tzaddik that their emotions are completely overwhelmed by feelings of love and passion for holiness. That is their entire life. They get it, it's real for them, and that determines every move that they make. The Benini, on the other hand, is still very much with a foot in this world. The left side of their heart still has very material, lowly, and sometimes ugly desires. They're not on the supernal level. But nevertheless, they can also, a Benini can also have an appreciation of the truth of God, not fully get it like a tzaddik does, but get an inkling of it, a sense of the divine reality, and that will be enough to inspire the Benini to live a passionate life, to, to live a spiritually passionate life. That even if you're not a prophet, you're not a saint, you're, you're, not, you're not a holy, angelic type of person, you're not, you're not that, that type of being, but still, you can get an appreciation of the truth of God, of the truth of goodness in the world, and that can be enough to make you passionate about it, to do something about it. Even if you don't get the facts completely clear. So, in the, in the words of the Alter Rebbe, even if the capacity of one's intellect and the spirit of one's understanding do not attain to the level of producing a revealed love of God in one's heart, to make it glow like burning coals with a great desire and yearning and heartfelt passion to cleave to Him, but the love is hidden in one's brain and in the recesses of one's heart. That is to say, the heart comprehends with the spirit of wisdom and understanding in the brain the greatness of the blessed Ensof, the, the infinite one, in relation to whom all else has absolutely no reality, and so the soul of every living creature should yearn for him to cleave and be absorbed in his light with a fervent desire to emerge from the, its sheaf, which is the body. Meaning that you're not a tzaddik, so therefore you don't fully get this. But you do have a sense that God is the true reality. And therefore, even though my heart is not overwhelmed with a passionate love, I'm not walking around floating in the air, but I get in my mind that I should have a passion for God that God is the true reality and I, that's what I should be yearning for. That my soul shouldn't want to be stuck in a body but should want to transcend the body, to get out of the sheath, the, 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 the jail that the, the soul is, is stuck in, which is the body. I know that I should feel this way and I have a bit of an inkling of feeling that way. That's where a Benini is. Except that it dwells perforce in the body. 
that the, the soul can't help it. By, by force, we're in the body. We're stuck in this physical world. We're bound up in it. And so, but nevertheless, I, I want to transcend it. I want to go higher than it. And no thought can grasp him at all, except when it grasps and is vested in the Torah and its commandments. As an example of embracing the king mentioned above, earlier in, in, in chapter 5, we spoke about the idea that if you really want to connect to God, the only way you can connect to God is through embracing his Torah, studying his Torah. That's his wisdom that has been given to us that we can connect to. So Abenini realizes that all I really want is to connect to God, even though I don't fully get it like a tzaddik does. But I know that this is what is truth. And therefore, I want to embrace the Torah and its commandments, which is like embracing the king, even though the king is clothed in many, many layers of clothing, you're embracing the king in there, which, which is from chapter 5. Therefore, it is proper for him, th- them to embrace him with this whole heart, soul and might, which means the fulfillment of the 613 commandments in act, speech and thought. That the Benini is inspired to do a mitzvah, to do the right thing, because the Benini knows that this is the way to connect to God. So even though, unlike a tzaddik, who is totally passionate about this and has no animalistic drives entirely. The Benini does have material and physical desires, but we get an inkling that there's something more. And that is also worthy. That is, that is also worthwhile. That is also real. That a, that a Benini is connecting to God on that level. So what this is trying to say is don't think that because we're not a tzaddik, because we still struggle with ugly desires and, and lower parts of our personality, therefore we have no clue about God, no connection whatsoever. Not at all. What, what we do get, the little that we get, is real. And, it, and that gives us a determination to, to serve him and to connect him on whatever level we can. So, therefore, when the Benini ponders this subject in the recesses of his heart's and mind's understanding, with the unanimity of mouth and heart in that he upholds by word of mouth that which has been resolved in the understanding of his heart and mind, namely to direct his desire towards the divine Torah, meditating on it day and night while his hands and other bodily organs carry out the commandments in accordance with the resolution of his heart's and mind's understanding, then this understanding is clothed in the act, speech and thought of the Torah and its commandments, providing for them, as it were, intelligence, vitality and wings wherewith to soar on high. Meaning, in these poetic words, the Alter Rebbe is saying, the Benini is not doing commandments with empty commitment. The Benini is doing the right thing and doing it with a passion, with a very deep passion. Even though there is a resistance there of the animal soul. But the Benini's acts, when the the Benini does something good, the Benini is doing it because his mind understands this is right and his heart is following. There's an idea in the Zohar, the Zohar says, when you do a mitzvah without any feeling, it's like a bird with no wings. It's a bird, you've got a bird there, but it hasn't got wings to fly up to heaven. Whereas when you do it with feeling, the feeling is the wings that make it fly. The main thing is the doing, doing the the commandment, doing the mitzvah, do a good deed, even if you don't have feeling and passion. But if you don't have passion, it's not going to fly upwards. It's going to be stuck down here. Whereas when you do it with passion, they're the wings that allow it to fly. The Benini is struggling with their nature to do the right thing. They don't always feel passionate about doing the right thing. In fact, sometimes they're in the mood to do the wrong thing, but they'll force themselves to do the right thing. So is that a bird without wings because there's no passion there? No, not necessarily. Because when you know in your mind that it's the right thing to do and you're clear in that conviction, so then that conviction, that clarity is enough to create enough passion to do. And that that is the wings that causes the good deed to fly. And so the Benini has not reached the level of tzaddik, but the Benini's deeds are done with passion and conviction, with, with emotional feeling as well, that you really feel like it, even though there's another part of your heart that doesn't feel like it, that is countering it, but the right side of your heart is full of a passion and love for God. And that is the wings to allow the mitzvah to soar on high. So, so what we see from chapter 16 is that the Benini is doing good that is thorough good. Not empty acts of goodness, not things by rote. They're, they're doing things with passion, with feeling, with, with a full gamut of emotion. 
that is where the Bainani has reached. And that is, that is, that is where we are uh, expected to attempt to strive. And to conclude, if we go back to the very title page of Tanya, before Tanya even began, on the title page where the Altar Rebbe set down his aim in writing this book, Tanya quotes the verse from the book of Deuteronomy. This matter, the Torah, is exceedingly close to you, in your mouth and in your heart to do it. Now that verse is the theme of Tanya, that serving God, being close to God, it, it is close to you. It is exceedingly close to you, in your mouth and in your heart to do it. Now, with all we've learned until now, from chapter 1 all the way till now, which we're entering into chapter 17, we can understand why indeed it is accessible to us all. Not just to do the right thing, but even to arouse our heart to love God. That we said until now several times, to, to do the right thing, well, behavior is in your hands. But this verse says, not just in your mouth to do it, but in your heart. Even in your heart, it's close to you, it's exceedingly close to you, it's totally in your hands to create a passion for goodness for God in your heart. With all we've learned until now, we can see why that verse is actually true. That it is not a distant thing, it's not impossible for us to serve God, not just in action, but even in our heart, to serve God passionately, to be a good person thoroughly. How so? Chapter 17 says, The words to do it refer to a love which merely leads to the performance of the commandments. This being the hidden desire of the heart, even if it does not glow openly like flaming coals. Meaning, you can have enough passion to do, even if the passion is not glowing like, like flaming coals. You're not a tzaddik. Your heart is not a light, a flame with the love of God. You've got all types of different conflicting emotions in your heart. But if you're able to do it, that means your heart is behind it. Because it's not possible to do something if there's not some emotional drive to do it if you don't really want it. And so therefore, to do it in this verse means that you can do it with your heart. That is available to you. The love that allows you to perform the commandments. This thing is very near and it is easy for any person who has brains in his head. For his brain is under his control and he is able to concentrate it on anything he wishes. If then he will contemplate on the greatness of the blessed Ensof, the infinite one, he will inevitably generate in his mind at least the love of God to cleave unto him through the performance of his commandments and Torah. Like we said in the previous chapter, that, you're, that it's the mind that is the key. If your mind contemplates on what's right, the heart will follow. And you've got a mind and your mind is totally in your control. You can decide what you're thinking about, what you focus upon. That is up to you. And so if you generate in your mind that clear thinking, then it will arouse enough love of God to get you to move, to do something. This, is, this, this little paragraph here is building on all of the information that we have studied until now. That we saw in the very early chapters of Tanya, that a person is made up of intellect, emotion, and behavior. There's the way you, th you think, there's the way you feel, and there's the way you act. The, the inner parts of your personality, intellect and emotion, and the garments of your soul, your behavior, thought, speech, and action. Now, thoughts are not going to determine your action. Your heart determines your action. You have to be passionate. You have to want to do something. It can't go from intellect down into action. It has to go through emotion. And so, therefore, you have an idea in your mind that you know is right, but you're not going to do anything about it if your heart doesn't want it, if you're attracted, if, you, if you're moving elsewhere. But we have learned that the mind directs the heart. The mind determines where the heart will go. Now we've got two sides to our heart. We've got our animal side and our divine side, the left and the right. The animal side of our heart desires that which is lowly, that which is selfish and that which is immoral. Our right side of our heart is pure and is ready to want that which is good. If our mind is filled with a clarity of what's, what's right, if we, if we think about God's mission for us in this world and what we're supposed to be doing, if our mind occupies itself with concentrating on that, then the heart on at least the right side will follow. The left side of the heart will be dragging behind, will be resisting, won't want this. 
But the right side of the heart is open to that. And if you, if you fill your mind with that, the right side will be filled with enough passion to at least quieten, if not turn around, but quieten the left side of the heart. And that will lead to action, that you'll do the right thing. It all depends where your attention is. If your attention is in worldly matters, if your mind is occupied with the mundane world, so then the left side of the heart with its desires is going to, to determine what you do. And you're going to follow your selfish desires. Whereas if your mind is full of what your mission is, what does God want from you? What is right? What is moral? If your mind is full of that, that activates your left, the, 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 the right side of the heart enough to override the left side, to quieten it. Not, not get rid of it, but quieten it enough that your actions will follow and you will do that which is right. And if, as long as you've got a brain in your head, you've, that you've got. So then you determine what fills your mind. What information do you, do you fill your mind with? That is totally up to you. And therefore, it is totally available to all of us to think the right thing, therefore feel the right thing and do the right thing. All the while, with another side of our heart, not wanting to do the right thing. But we're just not giving that attention. We're not giving our attention to that side of the heart. We're controlling it. We're neutralizing it. And this constitu constitutes the whole purpose of man. This is what we're in this world to do. For it is written, today to do them. This verse is a verse in the Torah that says, today you've got to do the commandments. You've got to do the right thing. Today referring specifically to the world of, the of physical action. While tomorrow, in the afterlife, is the time of reward. And this, in this, this uh, concluding idea, what the Alter Rebbe here is saying is that today, our life in this world, which is called today, is about doing. Doing the right thing. As far as having reward, as far as feeling good about what we're doing, that is in the afterlife. That's after this world. To live a, a life of peace, of tranquility, of spiritual serenity, that is something that we come to in the afterlife. That we don't get in this world. A tzaddik gets it in this world, but that's not us. We live here in the here and now, which is the world of struggle, and our job is to do the right thing. This is what we're here to do. To put in your mind the right ideas, which will inspire your heart with the right passion, which therefore will lead you to do the right thing. This is what we're here to do. Today to do them, says the Torah. Today you've got to do what you've got to do. Tomorrow, in the afterlife, in the next world, you'll get the peace and tranquility. That's just not going to happen in this world. That's not for here. A tzaddik, a tzaddik experiences it in this world. But that's not our thing. Our thing is to struggle. And, and so this is, what we're, this is our purpose. This is what we're here to do, to, to struggle. Just a, a thought to leave you with. This idea that the Alter Rebbe says that today to do them and tomorrow um, is a time of reward, you could also understand that in, in another way that to be a Benini means the, there's only actually one day that you have to not sin. There's only one day that you have to do the right thing to be a Benini. Only one day, and that's today. You just, just today have to do the right thing. That's all you have to worry about to be a Benini, is today. One day, today to do them. Just do the mitzvahs, avoid doing the wrong thing for today. Tomorrow we'll talk about later. We'll, 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 worry about, we'll worry about that later on. But there's just today that you've got to do, do things right. That's it. If you focus on that, so then it's totally realistic. What, what you can't go one day without, without doing something wrong and immoral and evil. You can't go one day without being, being selfish and indulgent. Just, just do one day of doing the right thing, of being good. How do you do that? By putting in your mind that what's my mission today? What am I supposed to do today? What goodness can I bring into the world today? This is what I need to do today. Once your mind is filled with that, your heart will be ready for it. The left side of your heart will be quietened and that's what you'll do. Just do it today. Tomorrow we'll, do, we'll get the reward for it. But today we just have to be good. We just have to do that for one single day. And that, says the Alter Rebbe, is koravelech. It's close to you. It's completely realistic. This is not out of the, out of the question. So... So what do we see? In chapter 15 we saw 
that the Baini always strives to take another step and do a little more than their nature and their habit allows. Just to stretch the hundred and first time a little bit further, that is where the Baini is, the one who's always growing. Chapter 16 said that even if the heart is not openly excited about it, the mind can always inspire action because the mind directs the heart. And so you may not be a tzaddik who's totally passionate about holiness, but your mind can be filled with it, and that will inspire the, 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 the heart to inspire action. And finally, chapter 17, this is indeed close to us all. This is realistic to achieve. You just need to be a benini just today. Today you need to be a benini, and that's all that's asked for you. That, that's, that's, that's all that's demanded of you, to be a benini for one day, which is today. So with this, we, we have concluded the second section of, of Tanya. From... We, we started with chapter 1 till chapter 8, which is the first section of Tanya, laying down the, the, the basics of who we are, what, what our makeup is. Then from chapter 9 to chapter 17, we looked at the categories of a tzaddik, a rasha, and a benini, and we've focused on the benini as being the possible man, the person that each one of us can be uh, if, we, if we strive. If we're in the, the, the battle, then we're a benini in progress. And... Next, we're going to see in the next series, the next section of Tanya, which tells us that our souls contain far more powers than we realize. Chapters 18 to 25 unravel the awesome energy that our soul already has without us even realizing it. Before we've even started this whole battle, there's a huge amount of energy that our soul has that's waiting to be tapped into. If only we knew we could reach so much higher in our quest to be a Benini if we just know what our soul already contains. And that, the Alter Rebbe will tell us in chapter 18 onwards, God willing. Thank you.